Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It's Thursday and we're going to talk about whatever we want. So let's go ahead and quickly get into those headlines because there's nothing else to do but do our headlines. Today on Before Coffee. The EU can't open for unity until it solves its Schengen conundrum. And the U.S. dollar falls as markets believe Fed is done hiking rates. Why do people ride electric scooters on the pavement or sidewalk for Americans out there? And controversial basketball coach Bobby Knight has thrown his last chair as we we also talk about all the celebrity deaths of October. God owns Junkyard at 70, how a humble family runs a neon business lit up Hollywood. Stories and more, which is National Ohio Day, which is November 2nd. 2023 on Before Coffee. Okay, let's begin with the first news story here about the EU because I love talking about the EU. This is from Christian Girosim on Euronews. This is also an opinion piece, so they're only of the author and do not represent the Euronews position. I don't know, there's a warning. This is an editorial. A chain is as strong as its weakest link, as the saying goes. And Brussels can't afford a lack of unity or coherence regarding free movement. If a country deserves to be part of the Schengen, it should be allowed in. Christian Gersim writes. In 2023, and the it's 2023. And the world seems to be sitting on a powder keg about to explode, and it's hardly time for ambiguity and loose ends. Still, the European Union has been dragging its feet in sorting out one of the most continuous yet fundamentally fundamental principles that stand behind its existence, the free movement of citizens. The Schengen Agreement sits at the core of its, this principle, with the area abolishing all types of checks at mutual borders for as many as 23 of its member states. However, over the years, the agreement which came into existence in 1985 and kept expanding as the bloc grew has become a bone of contention among some due to two main issues. A clause in the treaty which allows member states to temporarily reintroduce border controls and the enlargement process of the Schengen area that demands a unanimous vote by all member states. The broad conditions stipulated in the Schengen agreement sometimes do end up being misused, with politics playing a big part and the question of open borders can quickly become a major talking point on the campaign trail. So who is suspending Schengen and why? In the wake of the state elections in Germany and the ruling traffic light coalition has decided to try and appear tough on immigration by reinstating border controls with Poland and the Czech Republic, stating it was part of a push to stop human trafficking. Slovenia has also intensified surveillance at the border with Croatia, citing illegal immigration concerns. Notably, one year into the job, the ruling Liberal Party in Ljubljana has taken a nosedive in the polls, and it's becoming clear that the idea behind the move is that playing the immigration card could help preserve it. The populist party Smir, which won the recent general election in Slovakia, is now calling for border checks with Hungary invoking immigration. And then there's a picture here of a sign that says, if you're from, the Ch if you're from Czechia, take out your passport. If you're from, um, if you're from Italy, you can freely come through. If you're German, you can freely come through. If you're from UK, you can freely come through. So it's like, these countries are allowed to freely pass the border. If you don't, I'm from these countries, you gotta stop. Poland's populist PIS party has hoped to cling to power by instating border controls with Slovakia over the issue of immigration. Although the lost, they lost out on forming the new government, PIS is still expected to be a strong anti-immigration voice in domestic parliament and EU alike. On top of that, there are also concerns voiced by Denmark and Sweden, the two northern countries that also decided to reinstate border checks after recent Quran burnings. Recent terrorist attacks in Brussels, said to have been triggered by Quran burnings in Sweden, and the Hamas violent incursion in Israel on the 7th of October has also spur spurred Italy's PM, Giorgio Maloney, to take full responsibility for reinstating border controls with Slovenia, citing concerns of further violent extremism. What does this mean for aspiring members who want to join the EU? One of the most contentious issues on recent years linked to the Schengen is the blocking of both Romania and Bulgaria by Austria. 
and the Netherlands, respectively, in joining the border-free area. The Dutch argument for keeping Bulgaria out revolved around the presence of organized crime and corruption in the Balkan nation, an EU member since 2007. However, Bulgaria and Romania have both successfully completed the cooperation and verification mechanism. And according to the European Commission, both countries have made progress in the fight against corruption and judicial reform. For Bulgaria, this also meant renewed hopes towards the Schengen Ascension. And then for some reason I have a picture of street musicians. I guess... The, I don't know what that represents. <laughs> Over the past few years, both the European Commission and the European Parliament have repeatedly said that two have met the requirement to become the Schengen members and urge all member states to vote them in. Yet Austria, which has no border with Romania, justified its veto by saying that the country is an entry point for migrants into Austria and the EU. All this despite the fact that according to Frontex, Romania, just like the rest of the bloc of the eastern border, does not represent a major migratory risk. This summer, the European Parliament issued a press release highlighting the economic burden that keeping both countries outside the Schengen has on businesses and population, contributing to the increased price of goods and travel. Yeah, I seriously thought Romania was already in the zone because I knew a lot of Romanian students when I was going to university. So I guess it was really tough for them to get here to go to university because they had to go through border control. I thought they could just freely go wherever. Interestingly enough, the European Parliament also believes that obstructing the free flow of goods between Europe member states adds to, pollute, to pollution and acts as an additional burden to EU's climate neutrality goals. All is not rosy though. While both Bucharest and Sofia have indeed fulfilled all requirements to be part of the Schengen area, despite improvements, Bulgaria is still regarded as the most corrupt country in the EU and Romania following suit. I mean, somebody has to be last place! You know, but what does that actually mean? Are you the most are they in the most corrupt country in the world? Probably not. So, I mean, what what does corruption even mean in this, you know, I need to see this study that they did on corruption and see what they actually They probably wouldn't buy. be out in New Jersey. Yeah. Now, Alabama's the worst state in the US next to Mississippi. But are they it's worse like than Jersey, I don't know. It's New Jersey and Louisiana as far as state government. Yeah. The most corrupt. It's actually not even close. Romania's Louisiana, eastern border with Ukraine is amongst the most lucrative borders in terms of cigarette smuggling and illicit trade in the EU. Oh no, cigarette smuggling. Some progress has been made at Stop Contrabanda, a website monitoring cigarette busts, reported that authorities seized millions of contraband cigarettes last year. Yet the problem persists and can indeed prove to be a liability for the EU and NATO in a time of conflict. Still, a Schengen ascension of both countries would make mo more sense for the EU. It would help manage external borders better by pooling resources and securing crucial routes for getting grain out of Ukraine. So what can be done? A chain is as strong as the weakest link, as the say saying goes, and Brussels can't afford a lack of unity coherence when it comes to free movement. If a country deserves to be part of the Schengen, it should be allowed to do so. With the rise of populism, the EU surely doesn't need member states thinking that they have been unfairly treated or seeking other partners outside the bloc. This finally brings a conversation to unanimity vote that has, might need to be reconsidered. It might be not be in the EU's best interest that, in a time of war and great need for more unity as the country whims to prevail against the decisions of all the other member states. After all, the EU's future is at stake, and together with it, that of its 27 member states. Christian Gerson, who this is his article that he wrote, is an analyst and a journalist with over 15 years experience focusing on Eastern and Central European affairs. So that's why there's, they're very protective on, or very direct on Romania and Bulgaria being allowed in because they've studied it a lot. Um, I also want to point out that this is a similar problem in the UN. Because there's certain countries, I think seven or something countries that have veto rights. So if they don't vote for something, even if it's Everyone else says yes, right? If one of those one of those countries decide, nah, it's Security vetoed Council. automatically, and it's been happening for years with Russia. Russia's been veto vetoing a lot of things that the UN wants to do, and now, of course, in with China. the ceasefire in Israel and Palestine, that's also been canceled because the U.S. voted against it. They have veto mm -hmm. veto rights, so they just vetoed the whole thing. 127 state uh, countries were like, let's stop bombing civilians. And the U.S. was like, nah, that th this is okay. <laughs> Anyways, mm -hmm. on to your story. 
It does. Well, it's just like any organization. You uh, yeah. get enough members and pretty soon you just got a bunch of division because one grievance. You know, one, there'll be one grievance that'll hold everything up. Anyway, I'm going to go things around for no reason. You're getting distracted? It's your story. I know, but I dropped my glasses and I hate dropping things and rolling over them with my wheels. Oh, fair enough. Here, yeah. Oh, I destroyed my reading glasses for no good reason. For expediency. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> no, I'm going to pick them up. Okay. Anyway. And U.S. news and economic news, U.S. dollar falls as markets believe Fed is done hiking rates. And this is from Reuters, uh, writer, dude, what's your name on it? Gertrude Chavez Dreyfus. The U.S. dollar fell against the most currencies on Wednesday as investigators perceive, investors, not investigators, as investors perceive that Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell's statements after his two-day policy meeting suggested that the U.S. Central Bank may be done raising interest rates, well, this year anyway. The Policy Setting Federal Open Market Committee, FMOs, FOMC, as expected, left rates in the 5.25 to 5.5 range where they have been since July. The Fed did not rule out another hike as it acknowledged the economy's unexpected resilience despite its aggressive tightening launch more than a year ago. But Powell's remarks in his peers' briefing were laced with mixed messages that left investors doubtful that the Fed will raise interest rates again. Powell said that the Fed has a long way to go to get inflation to 2%, noting that the resilience of the economic data and the demand for labor that could warrant further rate hikes. But he noted financial conditions have clearly tightened and cited plenty of risks. Well, thank you. The most notable takeaway from his comments was that the risks around whether policy is sufficiently restrictive are much more balanced. Out are some words. Said Charlie Ripley, senior investment strategist for Alliance Investment Management in Minneapolis by email. The signal that while there is potential risk for the Fed to do more, the bar has become higher for rate hikes, and we are clearly seeing this play out with two consecutive meetings with no policy action from the Fed. The dollar index, which initially rose after the Fed statement, was slightly down at 106.64. It has traded sideways since hitting almost a one-year high of 107.34 in early October. On the back of a sharp rise in U.S. bond yield driven by strong economic growth. The Fed's latest statement noted that the job gain is still strong and inflation is still elevated. The central bank continues to consider the extent of additional policy, affirming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2.2% over time. They're still operating under the notion that they control inflation. Really funny. Yeah, they control it by making it higher and throwing people out of work, but... If that was their goal, I don't understand what their goal is, other than making people poor. Oh, at least we got these banks who can make more money. Okay. That said, U.S. rate futures have added to the bets that the Fed is done raising its policy rate and will start cutting rates by June. Bets on the rate hike in December and January have been paired back to 19% and 30% respectively from 28% to 38% late on, I did not understand that sentence. Oh, these are bets. Okay, this is like odds. Okay, so the odds are 39% late Tuesday. It has nothing to do with economic data. Powell had several opportunities to threaten another rate hike, but pass on most of them, wrote Tom Simmons, Simons, U.S. economist, in her research note after Fed meeting. The answers to the questions from the press were consistent with the high level of uncertainty about the outlook about how much lag tightening is still in the pipeline from previous moves. Against the yen, the dollar dropped 0.6% to 150.89. The, the currency pair typically tracks movements of U.S. two-year treasury yields. It's fell 1.5 basis points to 4. Point, I'm sorry, 11.5 basis points to 4.9. 4.958. The struggling yen has also gained, rising from one year low against the US dollar. Of course, the yen is going to gain against the dollar as the dollar 
Ollie compared to the yen. That's just logic. The struggling yen has also gained, rising from one year low against the US dollar in a 15 year trough versus the euro on threats of intervention from the Japanese authorities, with more pointed than normal remarks from Japan's top currency diplomat, Asata Kanda. Sato Kanda. Wednesday's data also showed showing, slowing momentum with the world's largest economy, putting the dollar on the defensive for parts of the session. The U.S. manufacturing contracted sharp, sharply in October after improving for prior months as new orders and employment slumped. Data on U.S. private payrolls increased less than expected in October and wage growth moderated. Private payrolls rose by 113 jobs last month after gaining 89,000 in September. The ADP National Employment Report showed. Other currencies, the euro was lays, laid flat at 1.05. The dollar fell 0.3 versus the Swiss franc to 0.979 francs. Oh, there's your story on the U.S. economy and the Fed and the dollar. And is the Fed going to raise rates this year? Probably not. But again, they think they control this thing and nobody gets hurt somehow. But again, they got to have rates high so they can bring them low, which really does stimulate the economy. I mean, it does just stimulate the economy cut cutting interest rates. If you went from five to zero tomorrow, boy, people would go out and start borrowing money and start businesses and shit. But since before, uh, back a few years ago with low inflation, the interest rate was around zero, they couldn't do anything. To improve the economy. If they want to improve the economy, they cut interest rates from 0.5 to 0.4. You know, yeah. that didn't stimulate anything. So now at least they have room to stimulate the economy. That's their only goal. And all of the rest of this is a shell game. Your story. Okay. For my story, we are going to talk about the conundrum. Another conundrum. Why are people riding their scooters on the sidewalk and pavement? It's a problem, I guess, for Oceana Dubot on Euro News Next. The e-scooter e company Dot is using AI-powered cameras to study people's use of their scooters. While electric scooters are reserved for the road in most European countries, some people still use them on pavement, which can be disruptive and dangerous for pedestrians because they go really fast. Franco Dutch company Dot equipped their e-scooters with AI cameras to gather data from over 3,000 trips in more than 6,000 kilometers in two European cities. Brussels, Belgium, Grenoble, France, and in Tel Aviv, Israel. They found that 93% of the time e-scooters are used on roads and bike lanes. If you have bike lanes, that is. When e-scooters did ride them on the pavement, three quarters of the time it was due to the road and infrastructure conditions, Dot said. The majority of people want to use public space in a respectful and safe way, a DOT spokesperson said. It's therefore unsurprising that pavement riding occurs in only a small proportion of e-scooter use. DOT found that 33% of those riding on the pavement were accessing, accessing scooter parking, while 23% were on the pavement after using a zebra crossing. Or a, just a zebra crossing. This, you can tell the person's British. They, <laughs> I don't a think anybody else crossing. calls it that. It's only the, the UK that calls it a zebra crossing in the Australia, I that's suppose. A, that's what I'm calling it for now on. Scooters users can feel vulnerable on roads compared to cars, buses, and trucks. And so if the infrastructure leads them to feel unprotected, it's to be expected that they move to air they feel safer, the company said. Irresponsible rider behavior caused around a quarter of instances where a e scooter was used on pavement. The company said it was working on solutions such as courses, targeted mes messages, and ultimately restricting access to the service for frequent offenders. While Dot says the majority of e-scooter riders stick to the roads, there have been several high-profile accidents involving these scooters. After a fatal crash in France, Sweden, and Spain over the past few years, author authorities decided to crack down on e-scooters with regulations that range from preventing scooter, scooter use on pavement, requiring helmets, and limiting their maximum speed. Paris even went so far as to start banning rental e-scooters in September, a first in Europe. That's why we didn't see any in Europe in Paris. They were banning them. They didn't, we didn't see any in Paris. Any scooters. I don't think. Maybe. I can't remember. The decision occurred after a public vote. 
Operators are now trying to do more to ensure the safety of their scooters. Our service can be tailored and adapted to suit different city environments, said Dot, adding it that it was sharing data and collaborating with cities on challenges they face. Laura Moller de Dumont, the city of Grenoble's mobility project man manager, said in a statement that the AI powered cameras on an e scooter could help city authorities and residents. Ah, uh, yes, uh, freaking more surveillance. It improves compliance with rules, preventing conflicts between pedestrians and riders. It also provides us with new data, highlighting infrastructure which is not working as planned or mis misunderstood by users, she said. These features demonstrate a further advantage of shared scooters over private vehicles, helping us city authorities to better understand the different ways to move around the city. Studies will take pl place in Madrid, Lyon, Lon and London this fall to further understand how people use e-scooters across Europe, the company says. I think it's also important to point out here that if these cities are using e-scooters to kind of in make their city more walkable and safer for pedestrians and tourism or whatever, I would argue that having cars driving around is definitely why scooters are dangerous as well. <laughs> right? If you just ban cars outright from being in the city, you probably won't have any deadly scooter crashes because there's no giant metal, you know, metal tons of me something to crash into. Though I think, I don't know what happened with these fatal crashes that happened, but I'm assuming they got hit by a car. I don't think they, like, drove into a wall on a scooter. They could have. It's possible. They look dangerous. I've seen, I've seen people sit on their Yeah, cars they go really fast. They, were, they don't come with a learner's permit. They just let people rent them and just get on the road and kill people. Yeah. And, and they are hard to break. So, yeah. Well, this article here I clicked Especially real quickly a says a 30 year old was killed by getting struck from behind by a vehicle, a motorcycle, even. A motorcycle. They should be also aware of how dangerous it is, and they, they killed somebody at, on a motorcycle. Um, there was a fatal crash in Sweden, but it doesn't say what happened. It just says, I think what happened is there was a bunch of scooters on the road and somebody crashed their scooter. Oh no, a cyclist crashed into a scooter and then died. But they were also 80 years old, so they were already pretty frail. <laughs> like, They're already pushing their luck. Yeah, like, riding a bike at 80 dice. is pretty dangerous. So Warren's scooters are dangerous because they're left on the street and then people run over them and fall off. And then, also they're dangerous because people are getting hit by trucks and motorcycles and dying because I, people just hit them? I don't know. I have to go, I'm gonna like, be late to work. I better run over this guy. I don't know. Your article. Yeah. You got no seat belts. You got your balance and you got your hands and that's about it, right? I should hit them with my car. I'm sure nothing bad will happen. Your story. Oh, there's bad drivers. As. Warren Zevon said, life will kill you. And we're going to start a new feature, at least I am. It's going to be called Looking Back at the Famous People Who Died Last Month. Basically, I, I haven't come up with a better name, maybe next month. But today, I was. Uh, we have a recent death. Somebody died yesterday, and that's going to, we're going to cover that one first because it's legendary basketball coach Bobby Knight. Controversial, iconic as he was, controversial. Bobby Knight, this is from USA Today, America's obituary writer because i'm getting all my obituaries from that they're short ones though this one's a little bit longer because it just happened yesterday iconic as he was controversial bob knight for decades embodied the spirit of basketball in a corner of the world is mad about it his hard nose fundamental driven style and attention to detail became deeply rooted in the culture of the sport for basketball fans in southern indiana and elsewhere his admirers standing as ardently by him as his critics often chastised him at the height of his success, few in the sports are more recognizable and more noteworthy. Knight died in Bloomington, Indiana, according to his post on BobKnight.com, a website that represents Knight and his foundation. The school later confirmed Knight's death, announcing his passing ahead of Indiana's women's exhibition game Wednesday at Assembly Hall. He was 83. Knight was renowned for his extremes and irrepressible winning habit juxtaposed against a fiery temperature, temper, sorry, and temperature, which brought him both fame and notoriety. 
Each helped define one of college basketball's most distinctive personalities for 42 years as a head coach. An Oroville, Ohio native who played at Ohio State collegially, Robert Montgomery Knight was part of the Fred, Fred Taylor's 1960 National Championship winning team that also included the future NBA Hall of Famers John Havlicek and Jerry Lewis. Knight made his greatest impact running his own sideline. After graduating from Ohio State, Knight briefly worked as a high school assistant before taking a similar position at Army under Tate's Locke. He replaced Locke as head coach at West Point in 1965. Over six seasons, Knight won 102 games at our Army with four 18-win seasons and only one year under 500 percentage, or 50%. That work prompted the move that would give come to define both Knight's career in a program that lured him away from the service academy. In 1979, Knight was hired as head coach at Indiana, a Big Ten school with two national championships, but some ways removed from its best years under Branch McCracken. Branch McCracken, love that name. Branch McCracken, it just sounds like a tree, doesn't it? Knight almost immediately restored the Hoosiers among college basketball's elite, advancing to the Final Four in his second season and winning a national title in his fifth. 75-76 team remains the last Division I men's team basketball to complete a season undefeated. Think about that. No team in college basketball has gone undefeated for a season since 1976. It happens in women's all the time. I mean, but that is, I mean, it's a feat is what I'm saying. So between 1974 and 76, Indiana lost just once in a regional final of Kentucky with a star forward Scott May severely injured by injury, severely limited by injury. Members of both the 74 and 75 team as a media successor have suggested that the former squad might have been the better overall, even if the latter finished its undefeated season and won Knight's first national title. So, and then there was the controversy. In total, Knight won 662 games at Indiana, mostly in program history by some distance, among Big Ten coaches with at least 10 seasons of service. Only Bo Ryan and Thad Mata surpassed, surpassed Knight's winning percentage. Knight's 356 conference wins were a Big Ten, Big Ten record until 2022, when uh, somebody broke that record, I guess. Doesn't tell you who. Knight was infamous, infamous, or infamous, for his temper, which directed at everyone, including referees, administrators, officials, and his own player. He was accused of assaulting a police officer in 1979 while coaching the U.S. team there in the Pan American Games in Puerto Rico. He, his comments about sexual assault in 1988 interview gave Drew nationwide criticism. Oh yeah, I remember that. He said, uh, "Oh, you're really wrong here." 1995, during a home game against Purdue. Incensed by an officiating decision to the point of drawing a technical foul, Knight then threw a chair from the IU bench across the assembly hall floor while Purdue guard Scott Reed stood at the line to shoot free throws. In 1997, Knight was captured on videotape with his hand around the neck of one of his players, Neil Reed, during practice. The videotape was later published by CNN. That topped a mounting series of incidents that moved the IU's administration to put Knight on zero tolerance policy for bad behavior. When he allegedly grabbed an IU student from campus the fall of 2000, he was fired from his job. Knight eventually took the head coaching job at Texas Tech, where he won 138 games and qualified for six NCAA tournaments and four times, six plus seasons, and, and six plus seasons in Lubbock. So Bobby Knight has passed away again. Uh, I didn't agree with Bobby Knight. I didn't agree with his methods. I kind of a dick. I mean, he's probably pretty hard to get along with. Strict disciplinarian, probably a right wing nut, but he was a great basketball coach. And to me, he was even better on TV. He had a TV career for a short time, and he was really good on TV. But I, yeah, he probably just didn't get along with anybody, so that didn't last. I don't know. But Bobby Knight's passed away. And other deaths this month that we have. We have covered some of them. For instance, Diane Feinstein, Suzanne Summers. Uh, we, covered, we covered Matthew Perry, but the ones we missed. Frank Howard, great baseball great. Uh, Washington Centers died this month. And he died on October 30th. Richard Roundtree, who played Shaft. If you don't know the Shaft, he was Shaft. <laughs> he was a bad mother. Shut Piper Laurie, 
veteran actress died at the age of 91 on October 14th. Rudolph Isley of the Isley Brothers famously had the song Shout and Twist and Shout. So they not only shouted, they twisted and they shouted. So the Isley Brothers, who had many, many hits besides then, but deeply influenced. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame members, Isley Brothers. Well, Ralph, uh, Rudolph Isley died on October 11th at the age of 84. Hall of Fame football player Dick Buckus died on October 5th at the age of 80. Former Chicago Bear Hall of Fame linebacker, known as one of the monsters of the midway. And knuckleball pitcher Tim Wakefield died after a short struggle with cancer at the age of 57. Former Boston Red Sox great. Silently suffered until one of his former teammates decided to tell the entire world he was dying and pissed off his family. But uh, that's another story for the angry people in the world. And those are today's, or this month's, actually last month's celebrity deaths. Back to you. Yeah, I didn't think you were predicting the deaths of <laughs> celebrities. Like, I predicted all these people will die in November. Well, Bob Knight did die in November. Just true. So, all right. Back to you. Okay. And Shaft is still a bad mother. So, anyway. Okay. <laughs> in culture news, let's talk about this very old... God's Own Junkyard is what it's called. This is from Theo Ferrant on Your News Culture. Hidden behind the shutters of an unassuming East London warehouse lies God's Own Junkyard, a magical wonderland of neon signs with a rich 70-year history. Chances are, even if you're unfamiliar with the name God's Own Junkyard, you've undoubtedly seen their specialist neon sign creations at some point in time. Their work can be seen in the background of iconic films including Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, and Angelina Jolie's Tomb Raider, or skydiving along the shop windows of London's notorious Soho district. The London-based family-run business boasts the largest collection of neon signs and sculptures outside the U.S. United States, all from the inconspicuous confines of a warehouse in Waltram style. As God own, as God Owns Junkyard celebrates its 70th anniversary this year, we thought we'd tell you the story of how this humble business evolved into one of the world's biggest players in the neon, neon sign industry. It all begins with Dick Bracey, a former Welsh coal miner who was fed up with working in the dark and decided to... <laughs> I love that. I love that, sorry, that line. He was sick of, he was sick of working in the dark, so he <laughs> opened a neon sign business. <laughs> And he moved to London towards the end of World War II. After a stint in the Royal Navy, he joined a neon company, where he developed his skills and began making signs for circuses and fairgrounds. Peters started with his own company, Electro Signs, which would later become God's Own Junkyard in 1952. But it was Dick's son, Chris Bracey, who gained a reputation in the 70s as London's go-to guy for all things neon, elevating the medium from a mere advertising tool to a genuine art form. He wanted to resign to the whole he wanted to resign the whole of Soho. He walked through it every day and thought it looked drab. So it his it was his goal to put neon everywhere and liven everything up. Linda Bracey, who married Chris in 1973, told Your News Culture at the Other Art Fair. By convincing nightclub and strip club owners to replace the red lights with technicolor displays, Chris transformed the district into a vibrant electric playground and earned himself the title The Neon Man. Neon has its soul. It lives at night, creating poetry with light, promising love and so forth, and hot bagels at n all night. Is that his, like, beat poetry or something? <laughs> Bracey said in an interview, One of the most iconic works was the iconic Girls, Girls, Girls sign gracing the outside of the Revu Bar, the theater and strip club owned by the King of Soho, Paul Raymond. Yeah, everyone knows the Girls, Girls, Girls sign. It's in everything now. The, Brace the Bracey's family sphere of influence, however, soon extended far behind the streets of London. Following a chance encounter with art director of Mona Lisa, the 1986 neo-noir crime film directed by Neil Jordan starring Bob Hoskins, Michael Caine, and Robbie Coltrane, Chris began making signs for movie sets. 
Chris was up a ladder one day and a guy came along and said he wanted to get into one of the girly bars downstairs, but they wouldn't let him in to film. So Chris said, all right, I'll get you to do your filming if you give me work on the film. And that was the start of our film career, Linda Bracey explains to Euronews Culture. From here, Bracey's neon works began starring alongside Harrison Ford in Blade Runner, Jack Nicholson in Batman, Tom Cruise in Eyes Wide Shut, and Johnny Depp and Tim Burns' whimsical Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, among many others. And then musicians came calling. Bracey lent his artistic brilliance to projects like the mesmerizing Neo Rings that encircled Blur in their 1990 chart topper, She's So High, and the electrifying neon backdrop that set the stage for Pulp's 1995 classic, Common People. Bracey has also been commissioned to create signs for a number of high profile celebrities including Jude Law, Kate Moss, and Lady Gaga, continuing a 70-year legacy. The neon man who died of prostate cancer in 2014 passed the torch on to his wife Linda and their three sons, Marcus, Matthew, and Max. Ah, the classic naming all your children with the same letter. This guy likes alliteration, I think. Who all remain determined to keep his family trade alive. alive. Nestled within their warehouse in Walt Walth Waltham Stowe, lies a treasure trove of more than 1,500 neon pieces, ranging from movie props to vintage signs once adorning fun fairs and circuses. It's amazing to be here, especially with the storms we've ridden, says Marcus Bracey. The rents have gone up, electricity has gone up, overheads have gone up. <laughs> Visiting the warehouse has remained free of charge, and Bracey says he'd like to keep it that way. He's looking into adding solar panels to the roof to help offset the solar energy, the, the soaring energy bills. The way things are going in London, in the whole world, we're going to struggle to keep this base free, Bracey said. It may end up being a private gallery because of the bills we've got to pay, but we don't want to charge people. It's not about charging people. What God's Own Junkyard is about, Bracey says, is offering people a space to relax and have a good time, while showing off the variety of work neon artists have created. And for now, that future's looking bright. Haha, <laughs> get it? Because neon lights are bright in your face. Ah, that's a great. Okay, there's your story. A cute little story about the guy you didn't know about who has been making all the neon signs in the world, it looks like, for 70 years. Got these very noble pursuit to make a bad chemistry pun. <laughs> oh, yeah, the noble gas. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Yeah, you got it. Hey, helps them. They also have smart people around to make good jokes. Uh, I guess that's it, huh? I got nothing yeah, else it. to say except that bad pun. All right. This day in history, Marie Antoinette, consort of uh, Louis XVI of France, was born. We'll try to go through this fast. North Dakota was admitted this day in uh, 1889. Uh, 19, 1917, British issued a Balfour Declaration, a statement of support to establish the British Palestine, home of the Jewish people. In 1930, Afari Makonen was crowned Emperor of Ethiopia, taking the name Haile Selassie. Haile Selassie, famously the, the uh, what do you call it, the um, the god of Rastafarianism. Not necessarily a god, but recognized as a son of God. A deity. He's a deity of Rastafarianism. 1936, the British Broadcar Broadcasting Corporation officially launched its first television channel, which was also the first regular TV series. In 1947, American aviator filmmaker Howard Hughes piloted the Spruce Goose, an eight-engined wooden flying boat intended to carry 750 passengers on its only flight, one mile. In 1949, the Netherlands and Republic of Indonesia signed the Hague Agreement, an attempt to end conflict over Indonesia's proclaimed independence. 1950, Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw, who won Nobel Prize for Literature in 1925, died at the age of 94. 1960, a landmark British trial, a jury ruled that D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover was not obscene, thereby allowing Penguin Books to publish the book in its entirety. An expurgated version had previously been released. 1963, South Vietnam, Vietnamese president Ngo Dinh Diem was killed in a coup, which was orchestrated by the United States, which ended in tragedy of the Vietnam War being expanded in a never-ending morass of stupidity. 1964, King Swad of Saudi Arabia, or Saud of Saudi Arabia, was formally deposed and was succeeded by his 
Brother Faisal. 1983, U.S. President Ronald Reagan signed a bill designated the third Monday in January national holiday in memory of Martin Luther King Jr. 1988, computer science student named Robert Morris released the first computer worm onto the internet. Medicine experiment. It brought some 6,000 computers, which was at that time one tenth of the internet, to a halt. So, your first hacker. 2000, the first resident crew, including one American and two Russians, arrived at the International Space Station. And our featured today event is Jimmy Carter, elected 39th president. Jimmy Carter, recipient of the Nobel Prize for Peace in 20, 2002, and Democratic former governor of Georgia, was elected 39th president of the United States in this day, 1976, defeating Rob, uh, Gerald Ford. Featured biography, John Baptiste Simeon Chardin, was born November 2nd, 1969. He was a French painter. Dyden, also died in Paris, born in Paris, died December 6, 1779, age of 80. Birthdays today, James K. Polk, President of the United States, was born in 1795. Another president was born this day. Warren G. Harding was born in 1865. Actor Burt Lancaster was born in 1913. Shah Rukh Khan, Indian actor, was born in 1965. And David Schwimmer from the, from the TV show Friends, American actor, was born in 1966. National Day Calendar. We hopefully have the right day for this. Let's make sure. November 2nd is National Deviled Egg Day. Mmm. National Broadcast Traffic Professionals Day. All right, so guys, give you a traffic report. Well, we got a tie up on a 304. We got the one. And they'd say a bunch of crap. You didn't understand what you're driving. What did you say? Tie up on a 304? What? What? Yeah, that dumb guys. It's their day. The guys that confuse you with the traffic reports, they give you a whole lot of information in about four seconds. National Men Make Dinner Day. So if it's Men Make Dinner and it's National Devil Deck Day, guess what I make it? It's National Ohio Day, which we recovered, which is a state in the United States. It's National Cash Back Day. So when you go to Walmart or wherever, get your cash back. All Souls Days today. All Souls Day. Not just half of them, all of them. And it's National Doge Day, which I it appears to be a dog, a breed of dog, a doge. Uh, it's a meme. There's a meme. Yeah. Uh, oh, doge. International Doge Day. Yeah, it's a, it's like a, it's a Shiba oh, Inu. Okay. Why would they? Okay. I don't know. So it's it's a meme. I, memes are so popular now that they're they get days, I guess. Yeah, get your tails wagging because today's possum is coming your way in the form of, okay, international culture sharing. Yeah, okay. Whatever, international doge. Your story. Tomorrow's gonna be groundhog. All right. Well, this is Allison here from the Netherlands. It, the weather's awful. It's been raining for like three days straight, I think. And it's windy as well. Uh, and that's worse, I think. W wind and rain is a bad combo. And we will be uh, seeing you Friday to tie off this week's news and leave you for the weekend so you don't know what's going on. This is Roger from the United States signing off for Devil Egg Day, which is... November 2nd, 2023 edition of Before Coffee. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.